Pardon. Okay. John Butler, uh, how are you feeling tonight? And what do you expect to get out of mm -hmm. night's call? I'm feeling uh, or today's call. very happy. I've had my walk in the park and uh, enjoyed nature and connecting with nature. Saw some baby cygnets and ducklings, and it was very lovely. And um, yeah, grateful. I enjoyed last week. Really interesting. And I thought of particular relevance to me as a business owner um, and somebody who may not be doing it in the most effective way in all areas. So it was, it was fun. Um, but it's good to have you back with us, Anne. And uh, Susan just caught the tail end of last week. And Steve, we had to do without you. So uh, yeah, good to have the six of us here today. And I'm looking forward to learning more and being a little wiser by the end of the call. So that's how I feel, Manu. Um, how do you feel and what do you hope to take out of today? I feel good. You know, I just woke up nice. It's, it's nice. I mean, I guess I'm going to have also a very nice day on Sunday and sunny. That's the expectation. Or do some rains on Monday. Anyway, um, it's glad to be together again. Uh, everybody, I, I was left last time with the uh, Becky's sentence of quite clearly, the individual is at highest advantage with the least stuff and property. It was quite provocative and quite, you know, <laughs> and led to a lot of thought. But anyway, I hope that I'm gonna have further clarification of what it, it really meant here and how applicable it is today. And uh, I expect us to continue and, uh, and learn and grow and then impact positively, better our environment and further. That's what I expect. Um, Steve, how do you feel? What do you expect? Okay, I'm glad to go now. Um, I listened to last week's tape, last week's recording, and uh, quite enjoyed the discussion. Manu, I'd like you to take the thing you just wrote and stick it in the, and post it in the chat. The thing that you pulled out of last week, because that was, that was, uh, I would like to understand more about that. This idea, it's fun to see Bucky. Um, I had a vision over this last week and then I've, I finally resigned myself that I'm not going to be able to understand what Bucky says. <laughs> but, but, what, but what I hope to understand and get better feel of is his perspective on things. You know, the window through which he was looking, this idea of the ontology of a thing, the system of a thing. And I think if I can move toward more towards that perspective where I'm looking at more when I look at something, I don't see a tree and say, oh, that tree was planted in that ground. I see the sky and the earth and here's the tree in the center of this system, like a giant torus. And I'm part of that system. And I think that's what Bucky was looking at. He was constantly outside, he was at the macro looking at the micro. And I, I think if I could just pull that off, I'd be a happy guy. So I hope to get more of that <laughs> out of this call. Anne, how are you feeling? And what do you expect to get out of today's call? Thank you, Steve. Um, well, I'm, I'm certainly glad to be here today. And uh, well, a bit um, like, and missing it last week, yeah, wasn't great for me. Uh, always looking forward to meeting every Sunday. Uh, the, the one that I just want to say is I'm so thankful because uh, after from the meetings here, a uh, reference, sorry, give me a minute. Sorry, delivery coming in. Hello, Blay Maso, yeah? Uh, uh, correct, yes. correct. Yeah, but those, those. Thank you. Oh, God, this is at the same time. <laughs> yeah. So fast. It's been fun. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Um, I'm going to have to inform someone to go and pick it up outside. Just give me a minute. Can um, maybe Susan, could you go first? Sorry about that. How do you feel and what is your takeaway today? I feel very pleased to be able to be with you all. Hope I get to stay. Um, I came in right at the tail end last week and walked into something where 
I'm sure I just don't understand everything that went into what Bucky was saying. So I'm hoping as we read further, that'll get a better perspective. Um, and are you back in or? Yes, yes, you carry on, carry on. I'm, I'm complete. How, what are you looking to get out of today? Oh yeah, um, well, okay. First, I think I've got some news to share because our refers and Julian and my team, we've been meeting every week now. Um, and we're getting closer to getting a collaboration going. So we're really excited between Malaysia and Colombia. So that's been really, really cool. Um, so wherever our discussions take us, that is what I expect to get out of today. Okay. So Joe, how do you feel and what is your takeaway? I feel good. Um, and I'm happy that everyone's here. This is a great group. Uh, it's nice to have uh, six of us here together this evening. Uh, or this morning, I should say. Um, I am like Steve. I am trying just to really understand the whole system and continue to learn to look at things as an entire system. Um, you know, that's what kind of uh, all these calls do for me is expand my thinking so that I can kind of look at things from a macro perspective. Uh, you know, in journaling, actually, a little bit this week, I realized that I look at things at a micro level far more often than I normally do, uh, normally thought I, I did. So that was a revelation of sorts. So um, it makes this call that much more important. Uh, I enjoyed last week's call as well. I thought there were some really interesting business uh, uh, discussions, but uh, be interesting to see where uh, this week takes us. I know that we'll be touching upon patents and some other uh, some other uh, um, concepts, prime, prime concepts of Bucky's, uh, specifically, I believe, self-discipline. So uh, that's my check-in. Uh, who hasn't gone yet? Well, I think it's just uh, it's ready to start our meeting, and I'll just okay. kind of jump in. I did not say at the beginning of the call that this is for the weekend of October 1, October 2, depending on which continent you're on. This is always exciting for me to get together with the whole world. I feel like I'm getting together with the whole freaking world on this right. phone call and, and coming out of my little tiny uh, cocoon. <clears throat> and, you know, it's part of, I, I, I love the context of this call is as profound as Bucky's paradigm. You know, we're, we're really looking at this uh, as a system. So I've got the reading. We're going to, we're going to begin with concept seven. I got, I did get, uh, Manu was kind enough to put his quote over here quite clearly. It's in the chat. Quite clearly, the individual is the highest advantage, is at the highest advantage with the least staff and property. Yes, yeah. not least, no less. <laughs> not less. Well, with the least amount of staff, I, I, yeah. I don't. I didn't say it the way you said, wrote it, and the way maybe Bucky said it. But I think that's interesting. This idea that uh, the things I own really own me, and suddenly, mm -hmm. if I own something, if I have property, I, I'm. It becomes a filter. Everything I see is based on my paradigm, and I've got these anchors over here creating gravity. I've got property. I've got staff that creates gravity. And maybe I'm not looking at life as clearly as I could. And I think that maybe this is prophetic about Bucky. He got rid of all of his staff and was kind of alone. He was like the Don Quixote of systems, right? He was out there like, hello, let's get connected and help this planet survive. Any other comments or questions before we jump right into the reading? Okay, good. Uh, you guys finished off last week uh, with this thing, talking about the patents. Uh, and Joe put in a link to uh, uh, to uh, Elon Musk, who actually had taken a lot of his technology and made it public domain, as opposed to putting a patent on it. And it's interesting because Ben Franklin did that too. Uh, ben Franklin invented a potbelly stove and he invented bifocal uh, 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 glasses. Uh, he, you know, basically discovered electricity, and he was really big on hey, uh, the universe. I don't, I don't know technically, but he certainly get, made those public domains so that everybody could build an efficient stove and so that everybody could have glasses instead of demanding his royalty, right? And uh, and Elon Musk 
uh, took a bunch of his patents on his electric guitar, electric vehicles, and basically made them public domain. Now, the cool thing about it, if you if you don't register it as a patent, and John, you correct me if I'm wrong here. If I'm a business owner and I have a technology and I don't register it as a patent, or if I don't register it at public domain, somebody else can pick it up and patent it and eliminate other people using it. So yeah. by making it public domain, it's saying nobody can patent it and everybody has can use it is that right john that's my understanding yes yeah so, so that's really interesting that elon musk would do it and when people asked him about that he said look we're so far behind on this electronic car electric vehicle technology if my batteries can help somebody else get in the game let them use them let them get in the game mm -hmm. and that's really profound that whether elon is conscious of it or not i call him elon like you know, but I hang out with these people. I hang out with people like John Butler, you know, Mon <laughs> and, and, you know, Susan uh, Cortesi and Joe uh, Bullock. And, I was hoping uh, you would actually have left my name off. No, <laughs> because I, I, it's just like, it's just, it's just like everybody it. else is really. But, but, but Steve, it's interesting that last week, John actually raised the contrast between uh, uh, Tesla and Atlassian. Yeah. Yeah, I listen to you that. Know, in the practical, in the practical kind of process of all those, maybe there is some, I don't know, I wouldn't say contradiction, but that individual expression. Yeah, I actually was contrasted. Yeah, I had a comment on that because I've listened to probably a couple of hours of Elon Musk talking about the way he hires people and how he runs his operation. Elon is very collaborative. When he gets up on a stage and he talks about his AI for his cars or for the battery technology, he's always giving credit to his crew. Uh, he's very, uh, um, um, you know, uh, democratic with a small d in terms of that. He has built teams. And I think one of the reasons why he demands people show up is because he counts on their collaboration that by working together as a team, by being able to interact, there's more comes out of that. And so I kind of wanted to speak up in defense of Elon when you guys were kind of talking about that, because in the context that John presented, it was like, um, not Vertasium. What was that? What's the business you referred to? Atlassian. John? Atlassian. 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 Yeah. yeah, that they were a software company and they, those guys writing code, you know, there's a, they can do that a lot at home, but but I wanted to defend Elon saying, look, he he re, he wants he wants the um, people to interact together and spend time together on the side. And I and I would say that in his defense. I don't know for sure, but I would just say that. So but that's interesting. What else did we I hope I didn't interrupt your thought there, Manu, but that I'm so glad. No, you that was all. Yeah. You know, we can continue. We we saw about concept 11. Yeah, we'll continue uh, it with. That was any concept 11. Yeah, now we're going to move off to concept number 12, self-disciplines. <clears throat> and as I, I look at this, I notice it's self-disciplines plural, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. I don't usually hear self-disciplines. I usually hear self-discipline. So that's cool. And John, and that's, what, that's why I was, I, you know, I loved it because it's self-discipline. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to say what I think of it, you know, later in discussion, but. I'm really thrilled by that. Yeah, very cool. And John, if you're good and you want to read. Yes, I'm happy to read. Okay. Concept 12, self-disciplines. Working assumptions, cautions, encouragements, and restraints of intuitive formulations and spontaneous actions. My own rule, do not mind if I am not understood as long as I am not misunderstood. <laughs> I love that. One of the things Bucky was very... Uh, felt very strongly about it. Yeah. Hey, when I read Bucky, I look for the noun and the verb. That first sentence is not a sentence. Yeah. That's correct, this, yes. It is not a sentence. This is an italic kind of introduction that often happens in a book. It introduces a chapter. So he's just putting down concepts here. And that's why it's in italic. It kind of sets up and says, this is what, when we talk about self disciplines these are the things we're going to hit on. So let's see if that's what happens. And we just had to click down to where it clicks into page. But he say, he say he doesn't care about the form for as long as 
you don't misunderstand. Right. You know, as long as you don't, uh, what did you say again? Can you get back to that? Yeah, well, he says, I don't care if you uh, don't understand me. I just don't want you to misunderstand me. That's right, yeah. Exactly. Cool. Any other comments or questions there? Shall we proceed? Okay, here we go. Go ahead, John. Personal self-discipline. In 1927, I gave up forever the general economic dictum of society, that is, that every individual who wants to survive must earn a living. I substituted, therefore, the finding made in concept one, i.e., the individual's anti-entropic responsibility in universe. I sought for the tasks that needed to be done, that no one else was doing or attempting to do, which if done would physically and economically advantage society and eliminate pain. So, okay. I want to comment, pause there. I read this getting ready for today and all of a sudden it sent me into researching Star Trek. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because yeah. in Star Trek, you know, nobody gets paid, everybody does what they want to do. And it's nobody has a living. Yeah, nobody has to earn a living. Everybody just gets what they, they do, what they want to do. And the premise is based on the fact that, and, and this is, could be true for, for, human, for human beings in the future, is that when, when I can 3D print anything and the cost of energy is free, and I have a printer that'll print anything and fulfill my physical needs. If I want a couch, it builds a couch. If I want a car, it builds a car. If I want an airplane, it builds an airplane. If I want an orange soda, it builds an orange soda. And if that's free, then suddenly working for a living becomes not relevant. And Native American, many Aboriginal, uh, uh, um, Aboriginal societies were based on that premise. There was no work to do. There's just a group working together to gather the food at the right time. There's work to be done, but not every day like, like, like we do today. So I studied a little bit about Star Trek. Any other comments or questions there? Yes, definitely. To me, here is fundamental, and there are a few words. Earn a living. To me, that's the bumblebee. Yeah. And anti-entropic responsibility. Yeah. That is really where Becky put you beings in universe specific yeah there is a reason and to do that to have anti-entropic responsibility you need to have learned and apply yeah and to have to be open to record record the consequences the result and input again into your system of action in order to influence your action forward. And that buttresses the notion of teleology. Doing with the end inside. That's my comment. Yeah. And my right. And as I read this, and as you said that, an individual has an anti entropic responsibility in the universe. I don't have to earn a living. I just have to fulfill my anti entropic responsibility in the universe. That's weird. Right. And I looked up what coming to me is word responsibility because. I've never, I've always talked about accountability and responsibility, the ability to respond. But I suddenly thought of the word responsive as opposed to responsibility. I have this down in my notes from when I was listening to the, uh, to our recording, the recording. There's a difference between being responsive and having responsibility. And I'm pondering that. Any other comments or questions? Yes. In 1927, how old is Bucky? 
Mm. About uh, 20. <laughs> no, 30. Yeah. I thought he was born in 1890. 97. So he was 30. About 30 then. Yeah. So, and he started, he said, in 1987, in 1927, I gave up. I learned mm. from where I was born. I reflected on it. And then I decided that something was incorrect. Wow. Therefore, I had to substitute this for that. I think this may have been when he went out to commit suicide. And he said that God spoke to him and told him that it wasn't his right to take his life. He had a higher purpose. And for three years afterwards, he didn't speak. And it was when he came out of that and started speaking again that he said, I do not want to be misunderstood. I'm happy to be not understood, but I don't want to be misunderstood. And that's when he changed the language he used. He developed his own language. So he never again spoke about sunrise or sunset because he said they were lies. Um, he changed his whole thinking dramatically in that three years post um, being told it wasn't his right to commit suicide. Uh, he was 32, I just checked, John. In 27. He, yeah, it says dead at 32. Yeah, go ahead. And so this would have been 35, 27 was 35. So three years before he came to that conclusion, he, he had committed suicide, if I have my math right. Mm. I have a question because um, uh, Bucky wrote this so long ago, right? And um, he's had so many people following his, uh, his thoughts, his philosophy. Um, and uh, he has trained so many people around the world there is a whole organization uh you know dedicated to uh you know putting forth his his teachings and then we have a group here um so my question is um and, and some uh, the people who have been following all this have been some of the most influential people right. so what what how far have we come with um you know with trying to drive the things that he talks about and uh uh, where can we find more of these people who are trying to change the maybe economic system or the way we live our lives? Yeah. And have you heard of a business program called Money and You? Yes. And the Business School for Entrepreneurs? Not that one, but the okay. yes, Money and You, yes. Yeah. Well, there are a series of business programs that came out of the United States uh, to which um, Bucky's work and thoughts made a huge contribution. So there are people like there's an organization called Genie, which is a non-government organization recognized by the United Nations. In the late 1980s, an American engineer did money in you and was exposed to Bucky's thinking and gave up work to commit himself to promoting some of Bucky's concepts. And he established Genie, G-E-N-I. Just genie.org. If you want to find more information, look at genie.org. Um, so Peter Meissen has made a significant contribution through presenting Bucky's work on electricity, the importance of electricity, the importance of how we generate it. And he was doing that in the 90s um, and the early 20s. Um, and the work of Genie has had an impact on the United Nations and on the acceptance of the importance of um, looking at the way in which we generate our electricity and where it comes from and the, the, the side effects of doing it. Um, so that's one person I know of whom I've met who has used Bucky's, applied Bucky's knowledge and principles and um, made a difference. And I would say that those sorts of things have contributed to the current view of the United Nations and many um, leading organizations globally that you know are now actively um, working in the area of climate change and um, sustainability. So there, there are various organizations, various people, but Money in You is still being run in the United States, in Asia, in Australia. Um, 
So my wife was very involved in that for many years and was involved in taking money anew into Taiwan and then China. Um, so she worked in Malaysia, Singapore, China, China, Taiwan, um, organizing and um, program director for Money New Business School for Entrepreneurs. So there are many thousands of people across Asia, particularly in China, who've been exposed to Bucky's work through these programs. Okay, so so basically there, there's there are groups and individuals as well doing this, yeah, but <laughs> not at governmental levels, right? No, not no. at a level that would change the economic systems or, you know, the social systems at, in, in a large scale, right? Well, the, so the it has problem, I mean, look, I'm, I'm going to hypothesize, but, but my view, my belief is that most politicians are not equipped to make intelligent decisions in relation to business right. or sustainability because it's at the next election that is the focus. And there's often self-interest and increasingly, certainly in Australia and perhaps even in the United States, um, the self-interest is being exposed. So I don't really think Donald Trump gives a damn about the average individual in the United States. I think it's about himself. Well, and that can be said of, of the Democrats too. The, the Democrats are as bad, Steve? Yes. Yeah, it's all about themselves, um, their own interests. And, and look at uh, what's just happened in the UK where the new prime minister within what a week of um, being appointed has crashed the currency and done <clears> huge <throat> economic damage to the whole country yeah. because she was going to introduce uh, lower taxes for wealthy individuals. And that meant that people lost confidence in the pound. So it hasn't been a good start for her to suggest. And I understand she was given advice, but chose not to follow the advice. So the problem we've got... Um, I have somewhere a recording of an interview with Eckhart Tolle um, on September 11. So it was the day that the Twin Towers went down and he had a previous engagement to be interviewed on that day. When the Twin Towers went down, he was contacted and asked whether he still wanted to go ahead with the interview, given what had just happened. He said, certainly, let's have the interview. So in that interview, one of the things he was asked was, so, so what's happening? Is the world becoming a better place or is it becoming a worse place? He said both. He said the extremes are polarizing. There are more people doing good and there are more people doing harm. So his view in 2001 was that the extremes were polarizing. I mean, if you look at the media, there are so many things that cause huge concern, but the danger then is that fills your focus and you lose sight of the positive things that are being done because generally with the media, bad news sells better than good news. That's true. So, and you know, we know now, particularly with social media, that there is more fake news, false news, misleading news, and that whole medium is misused for vested interests. Um, I mean, what was the name of that company in the UK that boasted about their ability to change the results of elections? Um, oh, Cambridge. Oh, Cambridge Analytica. Analytica. Yeah, Cambridge Analytica, yeah. So they, they were interviewed, uh, unknown to them, by a journalist who had them boasting about how they could take data and use that data and use social media to influence people um, to change the results of elections and to basically manipulate the world. Um, that was the end of them, but I'm sure there are still people doing it. Absolutely. And yeah. I'd like to, to your point, Anne, and to bring up what Manu said, it's great um, to find organizations that are, that are doing good things. The problem with it, I think, that Bucky would say, well, it's great to have institutions doing things, but that's not the solution to the problem. The solution to the problem is every individual needs to accept their anti-entropic relationship with the universe. I think mm -hmm. that is the key. And the like if the fact that we're doing this call right now, we're even discussing the concept. And what is what does it mean for me to be anti-entropic? You know, uh, suddenly it's this a local was, problem solver. That's right. It's a local problem solver. It's I'm going to take my energy and and do something so that something doesn't fall apart, you know, is anti-entropic for a while, right? Because it's not, I can't stop anything forever. Um, and I think that is the key. It's a bottom-up solution. And that was bu what Bucky was trying to say. I have found a really cool website that talks about Bucky's suicide and the and what he came to about that time. 
and it'd be mm -hmm. really cool to read those things. But let's take other topics that we have pending here. Uh, do you, before you do, you've just prompted me. We were talking about Atlassian. Yes. Now, if you want a really good example of what Bucky was talking about, Mike Cannon Brooks is a billionaire, one of the founders of Atlassian. What he has done is buy a significant shareholding in an energy company, AGL, in Australia, and has said to them, I want you to phase out coal-fired power stations. And he has had huge impact on the board. Senior executives have already lost their jobs because of his influence. And AGL has now, in the last week, I think it is, publicly announced that they are going to hasten the closure of coal-fired power stations. So his actions, his use of his money to basically force change, mm. like you're going to embrace change or you're going to lose your job, I'm going to take control of your company. And that has hastened, in the case of that one company, the earlier closure of coal-fired power stations. Is that a good example, Steve, of yeah. what we're talking about? I think that is part of the solution, right? Yeah. But it's Another not idea, part. Becky, that you was talking about was actually to explore, to exploit the phases of peak energy between mm. different pain, uh, parts of the globe. In other words, when uh, uh, China is sleeping, maybe America is awoken and China's peak is past. And they got to be, you know, because with material, all of this conductivity and everything, they got to be on the sea cables that transport energy between. The fundamental issue there, Manu, and the world is demonstrating at the moment, that requires cooperation. It requires mm. states and nations to cooperate. Now, when Bucky started writing about this, um, might have been the 50s or 60s, the maximum distance for transmission of electricity was about 300 miles. So it was very limited. By the time Bucky died, the maximum distance for transmission of electricity was about 7,000 kilometers. So you can have um, the energy being generated in the areas where it's not needed and transmitted to the areas where it is needed. So that if you're sharing backwards and forwards transmission, you need fewer power stations. You can operate those power stations most efficiently because you can't close a power station down. You've got to keep it operating 24 seven. But if you can reduce the number of power stations, reduce what's required because the off peak areas are servicing the peak areas and right. vice versa, the energy flows backwards and forwards. Now we've got the technology to be able to transmit over huge mm -hmm. distances. So I don't know what it is now, but some years ago, the largest single source of electricity in California was Hydro-Quebec because of the distance over which the energy could be transmitted. And with that distance, I mean, Australia is gonna be one of the hardest places to do it because of the limited population, but the huge distances. But in places like Europe, um, America, North and South and East and West, um, you can transmit over huge distances. You've got the population to warrant it. Mm. But the, the challenge is what's happened in Europe where you have conflict and so Russia says, well, we'll cut off your gas and your oil. Mm. And when you're dependent on other people, in fact, what's happening in the Ukraine and in Europe appears to be the worst thing that could be happening because it's going to make people want to be independent and mm. therefore not work together with others and not dependent on them. There won't be the sharing. There's increasing pressure. We've got to be able to domestically provide our energy needs and this need and that need, rather than achieving the benefits of sharing and working across countries. So the political issues um, are a huge block to what Bucky was talking about happening. Yeah, he was talking about that last week, actually. And we were talking about, you know, he thought that a lot of our, um, a lot of these efficiencies would overcome politicians but that has not been the case that's one area where he was actually uh, a little bit off off the mark um okay from looking at uh, what has been you know the sharing uh, recently yeah i mean by john uh, steve and, and manu um first of all, i need to say I, I really admire Susan's uh, dedication to this group. She <laughs> Agreed. Susan, I, 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 I am, I am so, uh, yeah, I, I, I was thinking the same thing, Anne. <laughs> yes. Hats off to you. So much respect for that. 
yeah. So uh, anyway, coming back to what I was trying to say, um, I, I I think a couple of months ago I shared that I was given the global note for uh, by this um for education by this Millennium Project, right? And the subsequent meetings with the with the with the CEO of the whole group, I kind of stepped away from it, you know, because uh, one of the things I mentioned to drive this is actually Bucky's uh, philosophies, yeah. And uh, so I brought that up, and I stepped away because he still he was very insistent that um, we have separate groups of people handling education. That means the tertiary education, you pass it on to another group of people. And then, um, you know, the, the various uh, levels of education. And the, that is why the education system is facing the problem we're facing right now, because it is so separated, right? And the uh, top level cannot impact the kindergarten. The kindergarten has no clue what the, what the tertiary level requires. And a lot of impact is made at kindergarten level itself, right? So, um, and, and the way I look at it, it has to be this whole track thing that you have to look at and not just track like, but related to all industries and, uh, and the, the mistaken identity that the highest authority is the university. Uh, my friend who introduced me to Millennium Project said, and you know, you're taking on a monster. <laughs> you wanted to, to sort this out uh, because um, we found a higher authority than the university. And until we can acknowledge that, uh, we won't be able to fix it. And I feel very strongly Bucky's, um, Bucky's philosophies need to be in education from the get-go, right from a very young age. And so children all over the world need to live what he's talking about and you need to build the DNA. Uh, but I stepped away. I haven't replied after that because um, I don't think I can work like that. So I'm not sure how to, um, you know, which organization that we can have to amplify the voice and leverage on it to do this. Okay, so I'm just putting it out there. But there was an observation but in response to um, your sharing. Okay. You know, and my daughter was, um, she was on a district. Uh, she was teaching English as a second language in a junior high school. And she was so effective at creating relationships with, the, with their students. The other teachers were jealous of her. Mm -hmm. She would stop and listen to the students and say, what's up with you? And her goal uh, was that she knew that every student had to have an adult at the school they could trust. And she would yes. challenge each of the students to find an adult they could trust and develop a relationship with. The other teachers were so jealous of her, they got her fired. She had a five-year contract. She was two years into her contract, and they had, she had three years left to go, and the principal fired her. She said, well, you can't fire me. I have a five-year contract. She says, yeah, but you're not going to teach her anymore. You can substitute teach if you want, but we'll pay you to stay out of school. Is that oh. weird? And then the, dist <laughs> the district heard about that. And the district said, whoa, and they looked at what they needed to do teaching coaching. And so they created a job description in the district that matched her resume and then invited everybody to apply for it. And of course, she was the only one that could apply for it. And she wasn't going to, but a friend of hers made her do it. They said, look, we created this job for you. If somebody's better than you, they can have it. But if nobody else steps in, this is your job. She became a coach, got assigned to seven teachers. They all hated it. Three of them came because they thought, well, what has she got? The other four came because they had to. But within three months, every they were teachers lined up to be under her tutelage, under her coaching, because she was she really had something to offer. She finished that off, and then she became a vice principal of the school. Now, this is funny, because now she's then she became the principal of the school. And now... Mm -hmm. She's sitting here and she had these uh, middle schoolers come in in a three-year middle school and they were going to go into high school. And she called up the principal of the high school and said, hey, I've got these middle schoolers coming in. Uh, I've been working with them for three years. These guys are really ready for a school system and I want them to come to the high school and do an orientation and meet the teachers and develop the relationships and see what she can do. And the principal says, there's no way. We don't have time for that. And she mm. kept bugging the guy. And, and he finally said, no, I'm not going to do it. She said, then why don't 
a couple of your guys come to our classroom and just talk to our people. And he got so pissed off, he went to the district and got her fired from being a principal at the junior high school because she was what? trying to integrate the school system. She was trying yeah. to do exactly what you were talking about, Ann, where the kids had a context and felt like they could develop a relationship and she couldn't do it. And now she's an independent consultant doing very well, uh, going to school districts that want her to be there. She's teaching on Navajo in uh, district school district. She's in a, helping the Navajos. She's working with the Hopi uh, and she's doing some white kid stuff too. But you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're up against a lot of stuff there, Ann. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, but we're going to take it on anyway. Um, Good. Because uh, recently um, I'm, we are collaborating with this um, this guy. He's literally a broadcasting station on his own in Malaysia. So we have we have uh, with him on board uh, because he's changing the education at tertiary level, and he's bringing in kids who literally failed schooling. You know, kids who are gangsters, and he's turned them. He's turned them into really productive people in two years for marketing and sales and and uh, to do business and all that in two years uh, that university degrees of three years and 10 years of working experience could not do you know so uh, I told him I said you have actually shortcut the whole process at tertiary level to two years which is actually mm -hmm. very much needed you don't need the whole entire uh, you know uh, and it has to be more practical, right? Because if it's practical, you hit the ground running and you can do it and shorten the process. And he's done it. The problem is that because it's two years, his students who can do better than degree holders, the qualifying thing is that you have to do two years to have a degree. Two years, you get a diploma. So his students get a diploma. So we're going to work on changing it out. So, um, and he's going to put me to hit the, the tertiary education as well together with him. We're going forward together. And I'm already thinking, how do I get that third year for, for the students, right? And we can actually do it. Um, get them working the third year and certify that as the third year for their degree, you know? Um, because I say his, his people should get a degree, you know? Because I'm working with his ex-students who are part of his organization and they're brilliant at what they do. And they, they were like, uh, couldn't speak English because the English was not strong and therefore, you know, they you can't really be in the college because you need a, a credit to get into college, you know, that kind of thing. And some of them don't even have the five credits to get in and he turned them around. And so the, the way the world, the Malaysian parents are looking at it, is his, his college is, has no standing, but I have so much respect for him. Yeah. So let's see what we can do. But I'll, I'll bring it forward if y'all are okay mm. um, along the way when we, uh, uh, you know, maybe some doors can open that uh, you you have access to. Be phenomenal if you could do that. Yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah. talking about medicine and and engineering and all that. Let me rethink that one. But just on the business side of industries itself, right. I think that one can change very quickly. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Uh, well, uh, yeah. I'm, 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 I want to come. Go ahead. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> okay. I want to go back to what Manu said again, about this anti-entropicness. And I think that institutions are great, but until every individual picks up their own baton and owns their own ability to affect their local environment and uh, exercise their will, uh, and they we're gonna have a problem. So these institutions have got to make what strides they can, but we've also got to have these institutions have to teach that individual responsibility. In America, we stopped teaching civics courses in the 70s. I used to have civics when I was in high school, but they don't teach civics anymore. American, American, young Americans have no idea what a civic responsibility is and, and the actual personal responsibility to maintain our democracy and our way of life. And that's why, and it's evidenced by all this crazy crap that's going on. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Steve, I'd really love to connect with your daughter. Okay. And, okay. and uh, John's wife, you know? Okay, John, let's, you see? Uh, let's send emails with Anne and get connected. You see, yeah. I'd I, I, I like to just say something here. All of this very interesting part of this meeting started with Anne querying about something. 
the thing could have been stopped there. Hey, and you know, we don't know, or you are telling some stories. But look at where we are. The brilliant example of Steve, that of John, that of Anne herself, and then what? And and ends with, hey, John, I like to be in contact with your wife. Steve, I like to be in contact with your daughter. Isn't that wonderful? Wonderful. It is. It is wonderful. Yes, it, and we bring refers in from South yeah. America. Yeah. Right. And, and, and it is the process. People tend to kind of try to hold Becky on the time line of his predictions. That's not it. That's not it. It is a process. Anti-entropy is a process towards veritas. Will never be achieved. That's right. Veritas will never be achieved in our lifetime. But the purpose of our life is to run the race and hand the baton. That is the purpose. To do something for something that is inevitable. That actual fact justify why we're here. Amen. That was the theology part. Of Becky. Yeah. That is a teleology. He said we must be here for a purpose. purpose. Let's work towards this purpose. Okay. Cool. Let's talk my rent. <laughs> cool. I, I tell you guys, I'm seeing this uh, website on Bucky's uh, suicide and the quotes that they came up with. I would yeah, love to send that to me. Well, I think we ought to just go for it. I'm going to invite uh, John to start reading here. And if you guys don't think it's a pertinent at any given moment, uh, then we'll, we'll change it. But I would like to read down through this first quote where he talks mm -hmm. about his suicide attempt. But I think it's good to kind of get a background. And some of this language reviews what we talked about last week. Are you guys open for that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, okay, sure. go for it. Let's start with maybe up here, John. Okay. Maybe you know Buckminster Fuller from the iconic images of the friendly old man with his signature horn-rimmed glasses. Or perhaps you know him as the buckyballs guy or the geodesic dome guy. If you know the word synergy, you can thank Bucky for that. But more on synergy in another post. While it is true that he invented many remarkable artifacts and held 28 US patents, his inventions are not the primary reason you should be interested in him. In particular, his inventions and prototypes and his personal success are side effects of a particular choice that he made in 1927. At that time, he was 32 years old and had a newborn daughter and a dependent wife. He was flat broke, unemployed and uncreditworthy. Desperate to provide for his family and somewhat ashamed of his apparent inability to do so, he decided to commit suicide so that his wife could cash his life insurance policy and make a new life for herself and their daughter. Standing on a cliff above Lake Michigan, Bucky prepared to jump. Just as he did so, he had a realization that was to dramatically change the course of his own life and eventually the lives of countless others. In committing suicide, I seemingly would never again have to feel the pain and mortification of my failures and errors. But the only by experience winnable inventory of knowledge that I had accrued would also be forever lost. An inventory of information that, if I did not commit suicide, might prove to be of critical advantage to others, mm. possibly to all others, possibly to universe. Though very unlikely, he decided that if there was even a one in an alien chance that his unique human experiences might be of evolutionary value to others, then his life was not merely worth living. He, it might be said not to belong to him at all, but in fact, to belong only to others. This was the moment when he steered his ship into uncharted waters and began living his very own kind of life with an, with an intention both admirably courageous and exceptionally disciplined. If I take oath never again to work for my own advantaging and to work only for all others for whom my experience gained knowledge may be a benefit, 
I may be justified in not throwing myself away. This will, of course, mean that I will not be able to escape the pain and mortification of being an absolute failure in playing the game of life as it has been taught to me. I just thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. That and is that, cool. Yeah, and it has everything to do with his, with what we've been reading about his 14 dominant um, principles that are going to lead to, um, and mm. in fact, he's going to mention them down here again. This is, does he get oh, it? I mean, it also speaks to one of his goals to eliminate pain. Yeah. Mm. And that kind of tells us what pain he was talking about. Yeah. The pain of failure. And um, it's just, he said, more, yeah, the pain, pain of and mortification, pain. I think he referred to pain and mortification. Hmm. Is yes, there any mortification of my failures? Yeah. Okay. Is there anywhere we can find his thoughts on uh, this moment in his life and reflecting backwards uh, because of what he has accomplished? Any any of his thoughts on that? He never, he he never had time for that. And um, he left the manuscript of his never last had time. Book. Oh, sorry. I was just saying that to Anne's answer, he never had time for that. Yeah. He decided to sail forever for the remainder of his life into uncharted waters. Yeah, and I believe that we're reading the book that he wrote as a result of that experience. In 1927, I gave up for, forever the general economic dictum of society that every individual who wants to survive must earn a living. Is that Star Trek or what? Mm, yeah. That is profound. And I can... And it was Go ahead, Joe. It was his inability to earn a living that was actually driving him towards that. Interesting, huh? Yeah. And he decided just towards to accept that. it, to take on a vow of maybe not poverty, but a vow of sufficiency. This is all I got. This is what I'm going to deal with. Let's see. Let, if I And if there's a one in an illionth chance that somebody else can benefit from my hard-earned experience, I'm going to, it's worth me staying alive. Um, it, it was what I was uh, going for was that he said that if he had one in an alien chance of you know uh, leave, uh, of of being able to to provide value right? right so did he talk about that did he say that okay he realizes that he actually did was able to and therefore he was glad he didn't commit suicide that's just something like that he I, I would love to hear the way he would put it. Yeah, those are the words he used. If this if this blog post is correct, we're seeing mm -hmm. the highlights here. These are the things he actually said, and that was actually his wording right there. And he talked about evolutionary value. And this brings up type one and type two, or class one and class two evolution, right? That Susan brought to us, reminded us of about three or four months ago, right? Class one and class two evolution. That's right. Any other comments or questions? Okay, let's go back to our reading. I think we're, I think we, we're right on the next page or the page after. Aren't we right here? We just only finished the first page where he talked about eliminate pain. First okay, sorry. paragraph, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. It's been so much going on, Steve. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> as a consequence, it was necessary for me to discipline my faculties to develop technical and scientific capability to invent the physical innovations and their service industry logistics. My recommendations for a curriculum of design science, synergetics, general systems theory, theory of games von Neumann, mm. chemistry and physics, Hang on, I'm finding my buttons. Thank you. Topology, protective geometry, cybernetics, communications, meteorology, geology, biology, sciences of energy, political geography, ergonomics, and production engineering. Just 14 areas of science to master. Yeah. Well, yeah. Even coming up with that list and thinking, I'm, you know, I'm assuming that he thought about this. Oh, yeah. 
in, in great detail is quite, impress quite, quite impressive. And so, uh, Anne, oh, sorry, go ahead, Joe. No, I was just thinking about even kind of being able to, you know, master one of these areas mm -hmm. would be an accomplishment. But. Right on. So, Anne, I, I want to ask you, just as a kind of a, a challenge here, do you have any curriculum on design science? Mm. Have you set up a curriculum for design science anywhere in your schools? This is quite the challenge. Mm. Yeah. Principles. And here we're going to talk about comprehensive coordination. So these goes right to your questions, Anne. How do we mm. implement this stuff? Right? Okay. Okay, let's continue. I, if we're ready, any other comments or questions? Okay, so we go, went from uh, design disciplines, and now we're doing concept 13. When you're ready, John. Concept 13, comprehensive coordination. Effected through discovery of nature, nature's omnirational, vectorial, quantum arithmetical, <laughs> geometrical, topological, equilibriously and dynamically coordinate <laughs> intra-transformative system, <laughs> i.e. synergetics, energy, synergetic, vectorial, and topological geometry. Phew. It's interesting. Okay. I'll yeah. stop there and then just, yeah. let's just reflect on it. Yeah. It's huge, but it is what we've been reading over and over all through Bucky's. Yeah. Let's not be scared by words. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, equilibriously. Well, effected, effected through discovery of nature's omni rational vectorial quantum arithmetical. Quantum arithmetical means that you can only add things, a quantum, something. Geometrical, spherical geometry, topology, we've been talking about it all the time. Equilibriously, there's equilibrium all the time, although it's not stable, it's always flows, but you have different patterns. And dynamically coordinated intertransformative system. It talks about eternally regenerative universe. It is changing from pattern into pattern, never completely overlapping. It's always veering. There is always something that is evolving. And synergetics, synergetics is basically to say, you know, the whole is more than the sum of a part. Energetic is energy, synergetic, vectorial, there's always a direction of flow and topological geometry. So maybe I repeated this, but I repeated so, it for I, a purpose that we don't be scared with. Absolutely. And I, I think yeah. that the first, that those last five words, six words, are representative of the entire first part of that paragraph. Mm -hmm. He is summarizing that big long paragraph in those one, two, three, four concepts energetic synergetic vectorial and topological geometry what kind of geometry do we need to study energetic geometry synergetic geometry vectorial geometry and topological geometry and i'm just now learning what topological even freaking means and how many are there how many references aha uh -huh, in a tetrahedron you guys yeah how many yeah 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 what yeah, 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 yeah. What does that mean? Sir? Yes. Yes, 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 oh. yes. I'm German. Oh, yeah, you're yeah, German. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were being Yiddish and you were going to yada, yada, yada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, Go ahead, Joe. So what's omnirational? Yeah. I mean, that, that, that I... I don't know what that could possibly mean. Yeah. I mean, I have a hard enough time defining rational. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Because actually, I'm not even sure what that means. And even me, more but... people have trouble finding rational. Right. But we're talking about rational in every direction. That's right. That's right. So that that to me is mind blowing. If if there's ever if there's a a dictionary where Bucky defines that somehow, I have um, an idea. I have an idea. On please it. go ahead. All right. You have your rationale. I have my rationale. Anne has hers. Mono has hers. Susan has hers. And John has his. We need to approach this omni rationally. We need to approach it consensually so that each of us can manifest our own anti entropic energy in our local space. I'm going to ask this. Well, let, let's let just even be more practical. Joe, <laughs> 20 years ago, were you talking about electric vehicles and all of these things? No. Okay, but so you there were was talking one guy who was thinking about ago. it, or two or three guys. But what is happening of the awareness of it? What has been happening over the years? What is happening? It's increased. How is it increasing? Uh, through incentives, I mean, through uh, the geometrically. actual accomplishment. Geometrically. It is spreading geometrically. Even <laughs> if they have not haven't got it, they read it. They know it's geometry. It is going, it's flowing. Interesting. Geometry. Yeah, you know, that's it. Because you, you bring up the electric car and why didn't the electric car take off at the turn of the century? That's not relevant. What? It, well, it, no, I'm just thinking because, because there it, were, wasn't there were events. it wasn't It wasn't happening. My lady, remember that we just carry in a baton. Right. Okay. And there have been so many things happening in life. A failure of humanity will have been that of not learning from those, even with enough lag, enough time pass. There's been slavery, there's been colonization, there's been killing, there's been imperialism, there's been poisoning, there's been a pogrom, there's been so many, many, many things. What is important is that we all learn about it. At least you could say, hey, it's happening again. Mm. It is happening again. Like right. many people are wondering now, the time that we live it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any measure of this time. If we were educated with the things of the past. And it's imp important that uh, Becky say, effected through discovery of nature's omni, through discovery, through experience. Right. And, con and, con and consciousness of that that is my little rant on this okay i'm, I'm just gonna say this yeah so just that if i can it will help me maybe pull the thought together more clearly in my head yeah um this uh omni irrational omni irrational omni rational okay uh idea because um i guess when he first started all this the, the impact that he made biggest was within the science community, right? Because he talks a lot about science. So mm -hmm. people out of science would not even have heard of him, yeah? And then later on in his life, I think he, he was able to impact the business world. Um, and then that's when um, I keep hearing uh, Kelly, uh, Robert Kiyosaki, Blair Singer talk about Buck, Buckminster Fuller, right? So he was impacting the business world. And then through Money in You, he was able to do that. And then later on, he it moved on to more of the, uh, you know, the more, uh, what he called the um, relationship part of it. And he was impacting uh, through the Landmark Forum, right? So mm -hmm. we can see that uh, they are all kind of separated and isolated, right? Uh, it's up to the people whether you actually attend and want to learn, okay, uh, through Money and You. And for those who attend and learn Landmark Forum, so what they don't seem to all come together 
at the same point, right? Um, if you happen to have business and then science and at the same time landmark forum, then you have a more complete uh, Bucky experience and also his whole philosophy. I'm just thinking out loud. Huh? So that means what we may need to do is to get it out there. Um, I guess education would be the best platform. Um, so now it's at which level to start this. And from the looks of it, it has to start really young where it gets incorporated so that the 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 okay the science part is there but literally whoever the child becomes um they're able to implement it in all aspects of their lives yeah that's what that that would make um his philosophy his whatever he's talking about omni rational would that be correct in yeah i, I would that yes direction? all right but I'd like to display, to say something. You talk about philosophy. Yeah, mm. I was just it's not about to say that. You know, in this. Yes. But let's so take what, the example yes. of us here, right? Where are you, Anne? You are in KL. Yes. Joe is in Maryland. Well, well, Susan okay. is, yeah. yes. Susan is in Arizona. John is in Western Australia. Steve in Utah, I'm in Cape Town. What are we doing now? Discussing this. How are we doing it? Omnidirectionally. Using technology. Spherically. Mm -hmm. That's what Bucky meant. He never mm -hmm. meant one individual. He meant a network of individuals. Absolutely. Mm. Okay, so that's that's what it is. Let us not sometimes inadvertently become victim or be, become <clears throat> victim of isolation of thinking that an, an individual is capable of all of those things on his own. That's mm -hmm. not what it is. Yep, yep. That education yep. is what we've been practicing because it's going to influence you in a way, and it's going to influence further you in different angles, wherever you are. Mm -hmm. So, and there is chance that those influences meet again and create new event, yep. new happenings. Yeah, that's my little contribution that I wanted to make to that. And I hope so you can find it. Yeah, how would you then uh, call uh, Bucky's, uh, you know, his contribution to, or, see, contribution is also too, too, small for what he does so what do you how do you describe what he has done well and he did it at many levels and in many directions one of the things right. we haven't commented on is something called the world game have you heard of it no okay so he designed a game because he learned that experience oh i do is one of the best ways of impacting people's perception the world game is a very interesting experience i've played it twice i think you need um, an area the size of a basketball court and it's uh, available through and controlled by the Buckminster Fuller Institute. And so if you get the license to play the world game um, and you need a certain number of players, but it allocates every player a part in the world over which they have no choice, it's allocated. So you may be a member of the United Nations you may be the leader of an African country. You may, so you get this role and you get the, the assets and liabilities of the role. And what it does is through experience shows you the impact that the decisions we make have on others around the world. So mm -hmm. it's a way of experientially showing people that what you do affects everybody else. And oh. it's, an interesting experience to do it takes some hours um but that is one way in our game because games are a great way of giving people insights and oh yeah absolutely uh, that's why he listed as one of his key concepts to learn about our uh, areas was game theory mm. i mean it, that is um, but, but he wrote so he used um the, the media he used books um, and wrote a number of books and used them to convey the information he gathered. 
Um, he, he spoke prolifically. Um, and I've seen um, video recordings of him speaking. Um, he said that his, his more famous design, such as the geodesic dome, gave him a lot of publicity and credibility. Um, but he was doing it at different levels. He, he, he traveled the world, he actually visited Perth. Um, he targeted areas such as architecture where he was very prominent in architecture because of his design science, the geodesic dome, things like that were very significant to architects and architecture students. Sure. So he, would, he did a presentation in Perth. I wasn't here then before my time, but uh, it's particularly attractive to architecture students and others who'd been exposed to his work through concepts such as that. So he spoke publicly, used the media, wrote books. Um, the following is a conversation with Elon Musk, sorry. part two. Sorry. Who's bringing Elon along? <laughs> uh, that was... <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to interrupt anybody. I'm sorry, but I'm thinking about some stuff. Are we at a pausing place? Did I interrupt somebody? Please finish. No, and just, with this no, point, then I no. wish you could find more about Bucky and how he spread the message and how we can spread the message. Is that right, Anne? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm checking into the world game. Yeah. So okay. I'll have, have a look into it. Okay. Thank I want to add to this. The world game about. institute was actually in Philadelphia here. Uh, it's, it's interesting. And just... interestingly, on that list of uh, design discipline was something on geography. I didn't get it clear. And really take that geography and contrast it with the way geography is taught in school. Okay. Oh, his dynamic map. Which will be but very interesting. Yes. Map, which is a completely different view of the world. When you see the Dymaxian map for the first time and you compare that with a Makeda projection, it gives you a completely different view of the world. Yeah. You know that when you look at the global map, the, the, the different projection. Africa always look very small. Always. Like Africa is like, you know, on the side, and the side is the most powerful. You take Europe, Africa is small compared to what you see of Europe. But you know the size of Africa? Mm. It's well, only second to Eurasia. Yeah. Here Africa is, is 30, 30 million square kilometers. This is a their max. Eurasia is uh, I'm looking. Million. Yeah, actually, that's funny that you're saying that. I have the same one. Yeah. So, like, here is Africa. Here, that's Africa. Yes. There's Europe. I mean, that's the actual size. The way that the Western culture, the way they developed a map in England, made the England and Europe look like the center of the world. But if you look at a map that actually shows the relationships between the actual sizes, literally, Africa is on three of these faces and Europe is on one. And now, imagine, imagine that the globe, we all share the globe, that we all consider as on the same spaceship, right? Right. And that influences from art, are affecting us all, right? How will you deploy your resources? And how do you use your resources in order to steer the ship anti-entropically? And John is showing that Damaxian you know, map right there. Yeah, I'm looking at one right now. It's interesting. Well, and John has one on his screen. Wow. If you guys can see that. It's almost it's like if wall, you taught yeah. children that, yeah, that they might be able to actually understand geography a little bit better. Yeah, and the, and the way, because if you teach geography by imprisoning the mind, right, framing the mind to say, mm. hey, geography is just Utah, you know, you have this and this and that, that's the way it's going to be. Right, right. The young mind wouldn't have any idea about what it is actually. And that is going to condition his or her way 
of interacting in the world. That's why geography is so important. Mm. And the experience, that's also why history is so important. Right. Let's learn from our past mistakes, conscious or conscious mm -hmm. or distortions, in order to steer, to take the better steering angle for the future. That, that's how impactful this, this is. It's not a religion. It's just the way we find ourselves in our consciousness of where we are. Comments and questions? Okay, I have one more, one more comment because I have been, the thing that I've been co coming to this unique for me, uh, that I've almost given up trying to understand what Bucky's saying, that if I understand his perspective, I'll get more out of what he's saying. And he, in this paragraph that we just read, talks about geometry, the geometry. We solve problems by using geometry, geo meaning earth, metri meaning ways we measure the earth. And he talks about vectorial geometry. So let me talk about a little bit about my favorite guy, John, I'm sorry to say, Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> but he was being interviewed by Lex Friedman. And he was talking about trying to create this artificial intelligence to drive this car. And when he first started putting it together, they were like taking pictures of these different things around. So there's be building a picture of a truck and a building and the car, they couldn't make any sense out of it. What they had to do in order to make sense out of the universe was they had to convert every photograph to a vector graph. So they showed the building converted to vectors. Okay, how fast is it moving? What direction is it moving in? So if, if when you're driving a car, when I'm driving a car, I see a big building over here and I see a big truck over here. Right. I don't worry about the building. It ain't going anywhere. I'm worried about the truck because my brain is actually seeing the vectors and attack saying, oh, look, there's this image, but it's traveling at this speed uh, and it's this big and it has this much mass. It's going to kill me if it doesn't, if, if I don't. I can drive through an intersection and you can immediately say, hey, what was the color of that building off to the left? My brain has no idea what it was. But if you ask me what color that truck was, I can probably tell you what color that truck was because the truck was a threat. And it was a threat because it's a vector in motion. And so... Mm -hmm. Bucky doesn't see buildings and trucks. Bucky sees vectors of energy. And this, this vectorial geometry is how we solve problems. If I see a building as a building and a truck as a truck, I'm not going to get it. But when I see that building as a certain kind of vectorial geometry and the truck is a different kind, now I'm taking trucks and, and uh, buildings and I'm seeing them as part of the system. It's a vectorial geometry. Wow, that was big. I uh, listened to Elon talk about that and how they've come to their like fourth generation of AI and it's all vectorial. They, mm. they, uh, they, the pictures are an afterthought. The pictures are what they throw up to, um, to create a metaphor of the vectors that they're seeing. Mm. Interesting. That was mm. really interesting to me. So I wanted to say that about the vectorial geometry. And as we look at that, there are several keywords here. He says topological geometry. I've been doing some research on the side here. Let's find our, our reading. Oh, my gosh. Oh, no. Where the heck did our reading go? It's a PDF. There it is. It's over here. Sorry. I'm, uh, I'm doing some study on vectors here. and But I'll bring that up later. There we go. Omni-rational. Omni Many th ways of thinking about things, vectorial geometry, topological geometry, vectorial geometry, synergetic geometry, and energetic geometry. Anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. I mean, if we ever get off of this introductory paragraph, that'll be really fun. <laughs> but there's so much power here, right? And, these, and this is in the context of comprehensive coordination. Oh, well, that's the, yeah. Wow. Any other comments or questions before we continue to read? 
Okay, I'm up for more reading if you guys are. Yes. I think we're right there, John. Self. Yes, we are. Self-development okay. involved my re-establishing the self-disciplining incomprehensively, which I originally received at the US Naval Academy, which training countered the almost complete trend to specialization in other universities and colleges. At the Naval Academy, the brightest were selected for the most comprehensive training. At the other colleges and universities, the brightest were corralled and shunted into sharp specialization. Right. It was evident to me specialization had been developed by the great master world pirates as a means of dividing up all the bright ones who might otherwise aspire to displace, to displace the great ones and thus conquering society by keeping all powerful individuals compartmented by their specialization by their specialization as the great master pirates reserved for themselves all the integrating of the wealth producing potentials accruing to the specialist multitude of special detail accomplishments i call them the great pirates for they were the masters of the world commerce which took place on the oceans covering three quarters of earth three miles offshore all man-made laws were nil only the laws of physical universe were operative. The great masters were therefore inherently outlaws. Now, there's a thing in, in law, and John, you school me on this. There's a thing called admiralty law. Isn't that correct? Yes, there is. Yep, yep, yep. You want to explain the difference between what, what is that in the context of? Okay, so um, the English developed a very comprehensive system of law. And since they... Um, relied heavily on the oceans and on ships and navies, they developed the law of admiralty. And that um, was a set of laws that provided for ships. So for example, I used to work a long time ago in the Supreme Court in Sydney. And one of the things that we did was administer um, admiralty. And one of the things we would do was arrest ships where appropriate. So for example, if you sailed into <laughs> harbour, and you owed money and the person to whom you owed the money was fearful that your ship would leave without paying the bill, they could seek, they could apply for an order which would arrest the ship. And the ship would then be held captive by the sheriff who also acted as the master in admiralty um, until adequate arrangements were made for payment of the money that they might never uh, recover once you left the jurisdiction. So admiralty law applied to ships. And doesn't admiralty law apply to anything that exists outside the 30 miles or whatever it is of the jurisdiction of the country? Well, no, it applies to ships, whether they're within the jurisdiction or outside the jurisdiction. The problem is once they're outside the jurisdiction, how do you enforce it? Right, I gotcha. John, that, is, that means the UK can, can arrest Isle of Man, right? And the Isle of Man, is the Isle of Man independent or is it part of the UK? What's its political and legal relationship with the UK? I don't know. I'm just talking because I know that, you know, the, <laughs> the <Isle of> Miss. <laughs> My guess is that uh, English law applies to the Isle of Man. I could be wrong. Okay. Well, I know that the District of Columbia... And there's a district in London, the financial district in London, but the District of Columbia in the United States is not part of the United States. It's, ah. it, it's got its own law. And I think there's another district in London where the financial center is that it's not part of UK either. Are you saying, up. Steve, are you serious saying that the District of Columbia is not part of the US? Yeah, it's not technically part of the US. the first time I'm getting it. Well, no, it's part of the U.S. What you're saying is that it's not a state. Uh, U.S. laws it's not may not state. apply to it. Yeah. yeah, it's its own jurisdiction, and U.S. laws do not apply in the District of Columbia. That's correct. That's interesting. I'd like to know more about it. But, for example, um, governments often set up at airports, uh, free ports, right. areas within the airport that are not subject to the law of yeah. the country to facilitate the transfer of property yeah without being tariffed 
That's right. There are limits, but still it's tariff free in that area. At Salt Lake Airport. Until it comes out of the free port, it's free of any tariff or duties. Right. It's so for example, Lake I think the Chinese used to have an area in Hong Kong where you could import wine and hold it in the free port and not have to pay duty on it. Yeah. Until you moved it to an area where duty applied. Cool. I'll do a little research on DC uh, jurisdiction. And I know there's an article, I think the book uh, Jekyll Island goes through and explains that really, really well. Uh, but, I, but I know there's a, a financial- the creature, from, the creature from Jekyll Island? Yeah, that. I think it does. And I know there's a relationship between DC and this financial district in, in UK and in London. And I will find that if I can and bring it up next time. That'll be very wow. interesting. No, I, I've heard that the, the city, the city has its own law in yeah. London. Yeah. But, you know, I, I'm really, I don't know. Johnny, you are the specialist to tell us about this. <laughs> <laughs> it's so oh, amazing. Bucky said, <laughs> said we shouldn't be specialists, so we should be generalists. <laughs> yeah. And he's about to make his point on this, I think, too that he worked with a group of people that didn't specialize. And then he realized at the Naval Academy, the brightest were selected for the most comprehensive training. Well, that, yeah, that, is, that is absolutely true. And I think that, you know, if you think about it, specialization does what? I mean, we do that in schools. It can have advantages. If you're a neurosurgeon, it's probably a good thing if you specialized in that area. I don't want a generalist performing neurosurgery on that, do I, Susan? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, the I'll example I often, often quote, I um, attended a, uh, a national gathering of some sort and for educators in Canberra many, many years ago. And the plenary speaker was um, the then managing director of Bankers Trust, Robert Ferguson who at age 43 had been awarded Australia's Banker of the Year. Mm. And he got up on stage and he said, I just want to tell you that I woke up one morning and realized I knew everything about nothing and nothing about everything. I had become so specialized and so expert in one particular limited area that I realized how much there was I didn't know. And I decided to set out to learn as much as I could about as many things as possible. So that was after having spent the first 43 years of his life becoming so specialised that he was awarded uh, the award for Australia's Banker of the Year. He knew a lot about banking, very, very specialised, but knew nothing about anything else. Wow. Uh, but society makes no, non-specialists, generalists look stupid, isn't it? I'm just talking about that, you know? Well, you need to have specialisation in um, areas like medicine. Um, or particular areas of science where you need to accumulate a huge amount of knowledge to be able to do what you're doing. And as I say, surgery is one of them, I think, especially specialized surgery. Um, There's hyper specialization, though. I think that that's a Bucky's. But I think it's still better, if you, even if you're a specialist, to have generalized knowledge right. and skills. Right. Exactly. Okay, I'm going to challenge that one. <laughs> You're going to challenge what, Anne? You I'm going to challenge that one. That you yeah. should. No, um, what, you... no, no. What, I, what I mean is this, this whole idea of specialization and generalization came up quite a few times uh, when we were, when we've been talking about education and we realized that higher ed was, you know, was specializing, um, uh, you know, people, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so the thing is that there has to be a way that people can be generalized and specialized at the same time. So um, this, this was a discussion that we had uh, together with my global CEO. And because we realized the world is going in this direction, right? Um, mm -hmm. And he has a drawing for it. In fact, uh, he has a whole philosophy and it called adaptive square, right? So when we looked at the whole um, education system, we can draw it up. You, we, we, we go deep into something, right? This is mm -hmm. the depth. We, and so it goes down very, very deep. And we realize today's world, you cannot, cannot do that anymore. Um, we start off more general and it goes down like this. And we realize that the diagram of what the world looks like is, it's not like you know a little bit of something, but you specialize in one thing. 
the world is going to be you you know a lot of everything and you specialize in a few things and one can be deeper than the others so uh, we we have got that drawing up for 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 the education that we're doing right um and it was my global ceo who actually uh, put forth this that um we have to train students to have depth in many 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 things and in some of these things they have depth in it and it's not one thing uh, and some it can be one where they have the greatest steps. So uh, we are working on the education to be like this for the for the students. Okay, so I'm just putting it out there. But you're right, John. You're absolutely right that um, you wouldn't ask someone who's not specialized in in brain surgery to do brain surgery. But I agree. To be, mm. And really beautiful mm. what you say. But there is a little part there that is hidden that you haven't seen. And you show it very clearly. You say you have a, a kind of funnel like this, funnel, and you make this. You remember that? Mm, yeah, like that. Don't you start so large. But the other one, for it to become a torus, taken from my friend Steve, <laughs> is to conscientize and to try to help the individual to start the other part that does this. To take mm. responsibility for a lifelong learning. Right. Mm. Yep, yep. Right? Mm. We, have, we have been committed. You've been committed to be here outside of your work at ACE. Mm. So on Sunday, you had a choice at this time for something. You made that choice. Is not everybody that can make that choice. And our job when engaging with the youth is to make them understand that, that there is so much further than what they formally get in the and the responsibility is theirs to pick up that hidden baton and run the course. And that and that is again coming to Becky's duality principle. The former school police try to do this. The individual tries to do that. And both run and run. And that's how you can do what Becky calls, I think you call it doing something that is. Um, where, where did I, I put it? I put it doing things of evolutionary value. Right? <clears throat> so, so, so we shouldn't be, yes, that what we're doing is at an institutional level, it is important. But guys and girls who go through ACE should be able to be different from others in that they take charge, they take responsibility for really that, assuming that role. That's why I say individual final examination. And it's to me is a very, very important point. Very, very well. Um, Susan, say something. I see you really. I'm trying to look at the score's value in, in going both directions. It's or the mm. community's plural at a minimum of two. So we yeah. I like you. I like exactly what you're saying, Manu. Yes. Yep. I'm, I'm looking for something here to show you what I'm, I'm I mean, yeah. Let me well, sometimes I want, I, to see your, I want to see your diagram too, Anne. Yeah, I'll show you one to show you uh, how much you can do within the same amount of time, right? Uh, okay, I need to go into. Well, in the meantime, I want to show everybody what this Taurus is that that we talk about here. And this kind of looks like, like, here's your generalization up at the top. And we specialize down in, but it's important to specialize. In other words, this relates to the vision and to the higher energies, and this relates to the lower energies. This is a symbol of the Celtic tree of life. And it shows up as a Taurus. The tree is in the middle of the Taurus and there's energy above it and energy below it. 
And by the way, we could go out to the web and find the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is um, very similar. Uh, this is the tree of life concept. Let's go out here to Google and I'll find the Oort cloud. But the Oort cloud is what surrounds our actual galaxy or our solar system rather. It's called the Oort cloud. There it is, two O's. And let's look for images here. Whoop, there's, there's a picture of it right there before it went away. This is the Oort cloud right here. It's a torus of energy. Our sun is right there. The planets are in a plane rotating around the sun, but there's energy above and energy below. And this is the shape of the tetrahedron. Ah, that's a tetrahedron Beautiful right scene. there. Yeah. Education is, a flow, is shaping the flow of energy. Yes. Education. And then you cannot talk about the sine phase without talking about the cosine phase. Yes. Both coexist right. and Here's both form the cycle. Yeah. It is a cycle of education. And here's another picture of the Oort cloud showing up more from the outside um, because we tend to not see it. This is all space here, but there's an Oort cloud. In fact, the V'ger uh, is approaching the Oort cloud, I think, the, the V'ger, that's Star Trek. The Voyager uh, satellite that we sent out is approaching this Oort cloud. I think it will do it in our lifetimes and actually tell us what's out there because it's only theorized by an uh, uh, astrophysicist, a guy named Oort back uh, many years ago. Uh, have you found that diagram, Anne? Um, I, I wonder one way we can show you the, ah, yes, I've got it here. Good, just all yeah. you have to do is push your share button and you'll interrupt me sharing um, and you can sh share. Okay, Th this was something that we were trying to explain to parents. So it, it's flat at the moment, yeah? Uh, but the one I was talking to you about, uh, let me let me share it. The one I'm talking to you about from our global CEO is that, uh, that one I'll have to find it for you and I'll get it ready for next week, okay? okay. But this one is more about, you know, how we, 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 we get the, you know, this across like this and the students can specialize um, and without compromise. Can you share your screen now because we're not yep, seeing yep. what you We'll do that. Yes, coming, coming, coming. Okay. So I'm doing I'm doing it boxes right now because um that's the way the parents can conceive it. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're we're trying to uh, get the parents to understand that the the real world value of what the kids are getting, right? So we started talking about academic skills, and in Asia primarily, our parents are so uh, focus on academic skills and we're like you know what do you realize that there's only a 1x value because everybody has academic skills which is which is at the core of it right and then uh, we started looking we, we what we've been doing for 20 over years now is that this x this um, next skill that we felt was so critical and it encompasses our entire education system which is the human skills so you got to literally wrap the human skills in every single subject. You're not talking about you want creative skills, you do performance arts. You literally have to have creativity in physics, in, um, in any of the subjects, including um, uh, economics, et cetera, right? So we've successfully been able to do this for years now. And we realize it doubles the, the, the children's value. You know, so when they come out, they literally can command that value, and it's not a hundred and twenty percent kind of thing. It's literally a two hundred percent thing. Then um, this, this came about on hindsight when we added in the entrepreneurial skills, right? Um, so with the academic skills and the human skills, and when you add in the entrepreneurial business skills, the kids have three times the value while they are still studying in school. Okay. Um, then when we started the, our ACE Adventure Biosphere Academy in our school, where we converged um, education with environment and, and, and entrepreneurship, because if you don't add the entrepreneur component and the, the environmental initiatives cannot sustain itself, then it's just another academic project, right? So when that came in, we looked into, it became, then we realized that the students were picking up green skills and impact skills, and that would literally four times their, their value of what they can um, give to the world, right? But when you actually look at it, it it's, it's not even a 4X, it's an exponential value to it, right? Um, and, 
and we have this diagram that shows um, all our different schools where the kids valuation would be if they pick on all these things. Um, so one of the things we share with parents is that, you know, we take the same amount of time to get the 4X or 5X that people take to get that 1X. In fact, if you focus just purely on one act, you take even more time and the students literally don't have a life. But when you park in all these skills together, the kids can do it in a shorter space of time than it takes to just focus purely on getting academic skills. And they come out with a literally multiple value of um, what they can do. So this is this is what we mean by okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna come up from here. Um, back to the zoom. Mm, stop sharing. Okay. So that, that's how you get this. So when they move on and you lay the foundation of um, of this having knowing more with with more depth than what they normally do in school, which is a very flat small thin line like this. Then when you get this, and when they go to college and university, then they start building more line down, downwards and with maybe a specialization down. All right, so th that other diagram I have to get for, for you, but uh, um, that is in a nutshell where we were coming from when we started uh, working on this. And we realized, yes, it's true. They take less time because they are doing real world stuff and school work then becomes so relevant that you don't really have to get them to memorize because they can just apply. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, Very and cool. this is the kind of things that we've been challenging for many, many years within the, the education system. It's a lot of educating that we have to do for the parents. Okay, I, I hope that that makes it clearer. Yeah, and you have another chart you're gonna show us next week. Yes. I'll put yeah, it on. And, and, that was, and one last thing is just to, you know, just now you talked about the Celtic tree. We have our blueprint. And right smack in the center is the Celtic tree. Very cool. Yeah. And the Celtic tree would be our students because we are growing them, you know? Mm. So will, you, will you show us that next week too? Sure. I'll show you our, our blueprint. You will love the blueprint because it pulls everything together. Wow. Yeah. That's so exciting. And, 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 and. And, and, and if you look at what I try to put there, I don't know, from what I get from you, the challenge of education, especially like is, is to actually mm. find ways to pick children's interests. Yes. And not to, squ uh, not to squash yeah. that interest. So that, you know, say it's very difficult for in a formal environment to really help a learner realize the value of spending some time or, or, or engaging into lifelong learning. Yeah. And is it in a, and is a, and is a, and is a voyage upon which you branch off, to come back and do things that work together mm. and spread during your whole life. And at the same time, you know, you have to help the child to be able to, to withstand the, the, the criticism, those stress, those stress, those stressism that is going to surely be victim of either in the family or amongst friends or even between your, you know, at your school, because there will be bullies. Mm. There will be. And that's the reality. Okay, it's time for us to kind of go. So, Anne, um, we're gonna. It's uh, thank you so much for sharing. We look forward to more sharing. You want to share how you're feeling right now, Anne, and what your takeaway is for today, and then let's pass the ball along until we end the call. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, I'm. I'm ex absolutely excited about where we're going with this, and. Um, this whole comprehension, a comprehensive coordination. I can't wait for that one because I think it will crystallize what we're trying to do even better. Uh, but every time I, I join the meeting, um, I, uh, the, the, it crystallizes um, on a more scientific level, uh, mm -hmm. what we are trying to do on the human level, you know? So, um, so the clarity I'm getting is crazy and, um, 
and it fits right in. I'm, I'm writing it all down. This whole, what he just said about, about um, colleges and universities, they take the brightest and they specialize them, right? Because we've been, we've been, we've been doing this and debating on this for the past few years, actually. Um, and so I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here on this one. So thank you, um, uh, Steve, John, uh, Manu, Susan, and Joe. Yeah, absolutely love this. Um, so John, uh, how do you feel and what is your takeaway today? I feel excited. Um, it's been another very interesting and interactive day. And lots of thoughts running around in my head from education to business to generalization and specialization and what we do to fix the world, or at least our small part of it that's within our reach. So uh, yeah, just Bucky was an amazing man and it's great to have um, you around me to help me to understand what he's saying because it sometimes is not easy. So I'm, I'm excited and perturbating, I think is the word. Um, so Joe, um, how do you feel? What do you take out of today? I feel good. Um... This was a very interesting conversation. I was not as, you know, uh, um, as vocal as, as I could have been because I was just taking in everything that was just really, uh, it was wonderful to listen to. I mean, you know, thinking about just even starting where, where you started with the idea of our personal responsibility from the bottom up mm -hmm. and what we can do locally. Hmm. is actually a really um, key takeaway because I think sometimes, you know, I, I started this call by saying that, uh, that I think micro, which is, you know, there's problematic with that, but uh, I do think that there is some, uh, I think we have to, sometimes we overlook the small things that we can do locally actually as, as well um, and how important that is. Uh, with our own personal responsibility. Um, you know, understanding Bucky's journey was kind of key, you know, for me, uh, especially with that paragraph. Uh, you know, it, it kind of gave a little bit more context as to the philosophy itself as to why he was so worried about human beings, you know, because he had been in a point of despair. Um, so, you know, that gave him, you know, perspective and let's face it, he's a very talented individual that could have gone down a number of paths, but he, uh, you know, went down the paths of trying to help humanity, um, and, uh, going through that challenging period was, was necessary, I guess, um, looking back at it. Uh, and, and I agree with that with the comprehensive coordination. I, I think that's really um, going to be interesting, especially the way omni-rational was actually explained. Uh, the way we're, we talked about that, 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 you know, everybody has their own rational way of looking at the world, but how do you come to an agreement? Uh, and that brings into another interesting concept that I didn't bring it up, but I was thinking about it with Steve with the idea of truth. <laughs> it does bring it does introduce that idea. <laughs> so I'm, I didn't want to bring it up and derail the conversation. Um, but uh, and I love the values creation chart. Uh, it was fantastic. And um, so. Uh, and um, so, yeah, those are my major takeaways. Uh, that was a wonderful, it was a wonderful evening. I, I very much enjoyed listening to people uh, and, and specifically the one paragraph uh, that we were just covering, um, you know, the, the, the under uh, comprehensive coordination, the first paragraph, that, that's enough to really put it this way, it'll give you a lot of time to think. Give, give you a lot to think about. So I, I think it, that's going to be interesting to explore in the following week. So um, I had Susan, thank you for being here. 
thank you for being here always. Um, uh, you know, it, it, I, 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 I do. I, I wonder what it'd be like to be a surgeon to come off, you know, just come off being working and just to come here. I, I, I really do imagine what it's like. So how do you feel and what would you like to take or what, what's your takeaway from today? Well, I feel humbled. Um, I am what you're doing is amazing in terms of application and clarity and perspective. Um, I, I think I kind of got right up front the whole idea about responsibility. And I remember just what an kind of earth shattering sort of moment when I understood the definition of responsibility is the ability to respond. But in order to do that, you have to not react and you have to take a moment to, to get that biggest view of what really is going on. So some version of truth, Joe, um, <laughs> probably not a full version, probably not an accurate version, probably not the same version you would see if you looked at it again in 24 hours, but um, no, I just, I, I'm blown away about the possibility that here I am, you know, late fifties coming to wish that I had been one of Anne's students as a little kid. Yeah. Yeah. What could, uh, what could lives be like when they're invited to this game of creation so much sooner? And um, so I'm anxious to see this type of application. And I love it, John, that you take these things and you put them in a completely different application. And um, so, so much to learn. Manu, how do you feel? And what are you taking away? Thankful. I think that has, I've grown in so many directions. I mean, John, Steve, and Anne today, wow. <laughs> those contributions and those examples were huge. Really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. And thank you, lady. <laughs> um, big, big thing. I mean, to me, this is one of the most powerful calls that we have. I don't know of you, but it was really, really leaded with tones and tones of practical information and, and things that have been done, you know, really as we speak. Some of the things that I got, I mean, it made me thought the responsibilities and Susan talked about the responsibility. You know, my old days with blessed singers, <laughs> the responsibility. And it like Jonah's calling in the Bible. You know the story. Mm -hmm. He knew, but he wanted to go away. He did not want. <laughs> but somewhat he realized that he's got to do through the test of the way of what he knew. And that's where we are today. And that's the challenge that we have to give our youth. Because nobody is telling them that is it. Either we let them go bumbling like a bumblebee until one day they realize it, or we have the opportunity today to kind of helping, you know, raise their consciousness to those possibilities and engage into those exchanges. And the fruit of which are huge. Not the least, just the satisfaction of the quest, the journey that you are engaging. I mean, it is important for Susan to say, she really, I'm out of this surgery block. I was eager, despite the fact that I'm specialist. I really want, I don't want to kind of endanger my, my, my patient, but seeing her with a phone and then with a whole gown of the surgeon yeah. coming out, sweating, and then taking off a scarf and say, I'm listening to you guys. That is great. That is a commitment. That's what we are talking about. And if 
Anne can churn out as many as she can out of that is. And in the exchange in each of us, well, you don't know. We don't have to leave to see what it is. I don't want to worry to say and to be frustrated that it's not happening. It is happening. And it is happening like Susan was the invisible gravity force during this call. She didn't talk, but she was there. And that is very important to me. The other stop is, uh, uh, no, I will stop there. Otherwise, I'm really thankful, I'm grateful, and I can't wait for next week uh, and in between. Steve, how do you feel? What do you take away? Okay. Well, I'm just really grateful. Um... Yeah, I'm 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 beyond words. Uh, the um, I I really have a thing about this vectorial geometry, and I'm really frustrated that I didn't have graphics to show it because I like the graphics. So I'm going to work on that for next week as well. What I'm loving is this connection that Anne's going to check with Diane, I think, right? But John's husband or uh, spouse, and then maybe I'm going to share with my daughter. I'm looking forward. Anna, I already sent you an email. Please send me some links so that I can get uh, Rachel up to gear as to who she's dealing with here, because you're like this a giant over here. I I've gotten to know you over the last couple of years, and you surprise me every time we talk. I think I know what you're talking about and what you're doing, and all of a sudden, bam, you blow my brain out again. So, and I think but one thing that's really uncanny here is that here as over the last couple of weeks, um, Bucky has been having this naval reference, and yet we have a naval consultant right here on our call with us. So here, is, Joe is a private contractor for the U.S. Navy, and so he's listening to all this, right, and understanding systems. I mean, if if we turn the show over to him to talk about systems with the Navy, which Bucky keeps referring to, our minds would be blown. And I just, uh, but and with money, blown with waste. <laughs> 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 yeah and i just uh, with susan's perspective and manu's perspective my gosh we really um what an exciting call this is i noticed my heart is pounding and one other thing i really related to the suicide conversation yeah now mm -hmm. i've never had um i don't think i've ever had real um uh, where I really felt like I was ever at all committed to suicide. But I will share with you that at one point I was very active in real estate and I had a $2 million life insurance policy because I, I had a certain segment of real estate all chunked off that I'd bought that was mortgaged up and I knew my family wouldn't know how to manage it. And so if I kicked the bucket, I'd have there'd be at least a $2 million pot of real estate that would be free and clear and handed to my family. And then around the at some point, I had a midlife crisis, and I just kind of walked away from all that and took on a, what I call now a vow of sufficiency. And gradually, my real estate empire uh, withered away for you know because of 2008 and just because of my lack of interest and where my focus was. And then I got to a certain age where my life insurance policy expired, and then I was uh, over 60, and I was and I got a term policy, and the most I could get was a half a million dollars. So I went down from two million to a half a million. And I looked at my real estate, I thought, I can pull that off. That's still pretty cool. And then after 10 years, that policy expired. And suddenly the most I could get was 200 grand. And, you know, I thought there was really a point where, gee, you know, if I had that $2 million and I weren't here, they'd have that. And man, they would be set. Uh, so I can relate to this idea. I didn't, I've never gotten on a cliff and decided whether I was going to jump off or not. I never actually had anything, but I did have the, rational thing that my life insurance was more worth more than I was I, that actually hit me and to have to relate all that today with Bucky that was very powerful for me and I was really delighted that you guys gave us permission to uh, bring in that outside site and kind of go through those quotes and still the part that I think that's going to be the hardest for human beings to get on this planet is the idea that nobody needs to earn a living to be worth something on this planet. Mm -hmm. That is to me the big challenge because there are so many people. I remember, I'm talking too much, but I remember I used to be quite active in my church and I was kind of a church leader. And I remember in this one group uh, and we had, we, you know, we allowed that we were in a group sitting in a circle and somebody was came in from someplace there on an airplane and they criticized somebody 
for being homeless, being on the street and homeless. And I can remember I was at that time very active going out in the, I was a real estate trainer teaching people how to make a million dollars. And I had several clients that I worked with who were doing their very best to make it go. They were following all of the formulas. They had self-discipline. They were doing everything and nothing worked. Mm -hmm. Nothing yeah. worked. And I, that's, I came up with the formula. I came up with one of my favorite uh, platitudes is, the formula works until it doesn't. And then what? Right. And there are these people who look at others and judge from their circumstance, which so many times is just so much luck. Their parents had luck. Somebody had luck and they're where they are because all the stars, stars were pointed in the right direction. And they sit there with that, with the, with the, with the utopia of abundance the universe can offer and look down at somebody else. Mm. Oh my gosh, that was just, I, I broke out in tears as I was sharing with them, you know, we are so lucky to be able to buy our own damn lunch. Mm. And uh, there are, and there have been some weeks where I couldn't buy my lunch, but uh, that happened after when I took on my vow of sufficiency. And then I realized I don't need lunch, right? So this idea that I don't need to earn a living. Wow, what a powerful concept that is. And how do we come to that? How do we come to a space where that actually is plausible? Uh, wow. So what a great conversation today. Thank you all for sharing. I can't wait till next week, <laughs> but I will. <laughs> I hope you all read the last statement I wrote there. What's that? You wrote it? Every one of you here have both the breadth and depth. You are, uh, you are who we want to nurture in our young ones. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for Thank that. Thank you, Anne. Okay. See you next week. Um, we complete? Yes. We're complete. Excellent. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Let me see here. Take care, Manu.